Welcome to Carefree and Conscious with me, Suzanne Wilson, the Carefree Medium. Today, Proof of Angels and Demons with world-renowned psychic medium and ghost investigator, Chris Fleming. Chris is perhaps best known as the co-host of TV shows including Psychic Kids, Dead Famous, Haunted Scotland, and his appearances on Larry King Live, Ghost Hunters, Ghost Adventures, and The Haunted. Chris is also a talented artist and an animal lover. He has actually helped a demon turn towards the light. Today may be a little scary, but overall, the information that you will learn is helpful, hopeful, and healing. And now, carefree and conscious, proof of angels and demons. Welcome to Carefree and Conscious, Chris Fleming. We're happy to have you here. Thanks for having me, ladies. I appreciate it. Well, it's great to see you. And I I think you know that I have the utmost respect for you in how you approach working with the spirit world. And um, I want to ask you, first off, did this all start because you were a a little kid in a haunted house? Or what do you think got you into recognizing your abilities rather than hiding them? Well, it was really simple and, you know, it was kind of different than, than most people is when I first started having experiences when I was a little kid, you know, there's, there's shadows that would come out of the walls. And then there was soldiers that came out screaming, bloody and dying. And then other things that were trying to make contact with me, which I was terrified. Uh, it was very dark and even some dark and evil stuff too. My parents ended up changing the wallpaper saying, oh, it's just dreams and nightmares. And we picked out some lions and tigers type wallpaper And we put that up, but then I still started having some of these experiences. So they said, well, we're not changing the wallpaper now. So I had to learn to live with it. But what would happen is I would, I would scream and call for my dad. He would come into the room, he'd turn on the light and he said, oh, it's just a dream. And then it got to a point where, you know, I'd say to these things, my dad says, you're just a dream. You're not real until this shadow form came up to the side of the bed, pulled on the sheets. I pulled back, it pulled back and I screamed because I realized this thing has a physical force. It's real, right? So my dad comes into the room. I start sleeping in my parents' room whenever I felt them around. Or, you know, the weird thing is, is you could start as a little kid, you can sense them watching you as if somebody else was there, but sometimes you couldn't see them. And we all know that experience as as adults, but when you're little kids, you know, it's really scary because you're trying to figure out where they are, you know, and I didn't figure that out yet in being able to sense that discernment. But I started seeing them in my dad's room too, you know, and then growing up, my dad would contradict himself because he would say, it's just your imagination. Then he would say, tell them to go away. Just ignore them. They'll go away. I go, dad, there's, there's three pe- three spirits in the room, the edge of the bed. Chris, just ignore them. Ignore what? He's actually confirming that it's there. Ignore them. And, and I would see him walk by them when he'd see them. But then there was the one time this negative entity appeared besides the bed, screamed, and the, the room lit up. We both scrambled off the bed to the other side, jumped. He grabbed me and protected me like a father would on top of me. And he looked up and it was gone. I'm screaming. He screams He's like, quiet, quiet, quiet. And he picks up the phone. And back then we had the, the rotary phones, you know, this is like 72, 73. And he's going, shh, who are you calling? You know, cause it's like probably three, four in the morning. He's like, I'm calling the police. I said, but they're gone, <laughs> you know? And so he hangs up and he picks it up again. Cause he doesn't know what to do. So it was at that moment I realized he knew you know, and he just didn't want to talk about it. Later in life, I was very fortunate. I mean, we had an off and on relationship because we're both Tauruses. We're both stubborn. And uh, we didn't talk for several years here and there. But after his stroke and heart attack, I raced to the hospital to see him. And I got five wonderful years with him before he passed that we discussed everything. I videotaped a lot of it. Some of it's on YouTube, Reggie Fleming videos. And I had a great time you know, discussing all about life, learning more about him. But then also we went back and we talked about these things. And I remember him saying, Chris, there's no, you know, son, there's no such thing as ghosts. Like, what do you mean, dad? Dad, you reacted. Remember the time off? He goes, I know they're just people. What? Wow. They're just people. They're just people. And I said, so he wasn't afraid. No, he was. I said, so dad, you mean to tell me when you walked in the room and I said, there was a ghost to the side, there's three at the bed and this and that. And you saw him too. He says, yeah. They weren't ghosts. They're just people. I said, dad, if if you weren't in that bed right now, I would be putting you in that bed. I said, do you realize 
what I went through as a kid goes, Hey, you're the one that had the problem with them. Not me. He's like, son, listen, I was playing hockey. I was at the end of my career. I was trying to get picked up by another team. I couldn't. So I was working odd jobs, trying to support you and your mother, you and your mother. We'd fight once in a while. So thinking about these and dealing with these, I didn't have time for that. I had to get up in the morning, go to work and try to figure out what I was going to do the next day for my career. You're the one that had the problems with them. And I'm like, so it, there was a relief, but there was also like, dad, I, I needed you to talk to He goes, He's like, son, I did not know what to tell you, you know? And then I, I find out, you know, through my grandma that my great grandma was psychic and sensitive. My grandma never wanted to talk about it. So I think she had a fear factor going on regarding this. So my great grandma saw them and talked to them. But the problem was I couldn't have a conversation with her before she died. She was 91. She died in 91 or 93. But I met her, I hung out with her, but she only spoke Polish and I didn't speak Polish. So I'm like, I couldn't have a conversation with her, you know? And my grandma didn't want to be the decipher, you know, and, and, and translate everything for her because she didn't want to talk about it. Now, Chris, is that your your dad's mom's my dad's, side? Yes, my dad's grandmother. Okay. Do, do you, did any of this come from mom's side or did, yes. what, did it? Here's okay. The thing is my mom's side, and my dad's side would see that stuff. Okay. And obviously, you know, I knew when I was younger, my dad's seen this. He's like, but, and my mom would say, you know, you know, Reggie, you know, your father's saying something he doesn't want to talk about, but he's saying he's seen stuff too when I was a little kid. But then we had the full blown adult conversation as an adult. My mom didn't see ghosts. She felt stuff. She would feel stuff when she was a kid that something was coming for her. Something was in the room and she would close her eyes thinking that she's being taken somewhere or whatever. But she would also have dreams that would come true. Visions, feelings, and dreams, precognitive dreams. That's where I got that from because I had a dream when I was three years old that my sister drowned and I woke up screaming because I love my sister and my, my parents taught me to protect my sister and she meant everything to me. She still does. And I told her, she, you know, she drowned. She went in this darkness. So my mom rehearsed the dream with me. She went, checked on my sisters. She was fine. She was only a year and a half year old. And my mom goes, tell me what you dreamt. Cause my mom knows, and I'll tell you her story in a second, that dreams are real and they can happen. So she was not going to ignore it because she saw the emotional terror I was in. So my mom rehearsed it with me and said, son, you're, you know, you're too young to swim. You don't know how to swim and jump in because I told her I jumped in this darkness and it just it went completely dark, which means death or it means, you know, it's yet to happen. So wait, wait, one second here. This is, this is instructive yet to happen. Something that's yet to happen comes to you. How again? Black, all blackness. All blackness around the image? Correct. Correct. Okay. Yeah, please continue. Yep. Uh, great point. You just picked out there a detail. And so I rehearsed it with my mom. I told her it was happening. And there's this other kids there. And a girl throws uh, this giant lifesaver, you know, because I'm a, you know, as a kid, you see candy and it looks just like a giant lifesaver. But it was a life preserver, as we know. And that was the trigger because when my mom rehearsed it with me. She tells my dad, whatever you do, because my dad got traded, do not get a house with a pool. Or if we get an apartment, don't get a, Make sure there's no pool there. Well, we went to Salt Lake City for six months because my dad was playing hockey there. And a whole bunch of people were over and all the kids were making noise. So the parents says, why don't you guys go outside and play? So they brought my sister. They put her up in a little snowsuit. And this would have been in October. And uh, the little girl goes, hey, is there a pool around here? I said, yeah, there's there's one you know, right across the uh, parking lot. So we went over there. There was a tarp that was over the pool. But because the snow had melted and it, there was water that was in the middle of it. So... The girl says, let's play a game, 13 year old. Everybody touched their foot on the tarp. So we're all doing that. And then she's holding my sister. And as my sister, who was one and a half, touches it, slips out of her hand, slides into the middle of the pool onto the on, and the tarp to the middle where the water is. And now my sister's just floating on her back with her snowsuits, keeping her afloat. So the little girl's like, oh, shoot, you know, uh, she's trying to freak out. So the girl, and I, I haven't figured out what's happening yet. You know, I'm just watching this going, oh, we'll get her. You know, big deal. Girl gets a skimmer, can't get her, throws the life preserver. And as she threw the life preserver, <gasps> trigger as we know in psychology, I scream, my sister's drowning, my sister's drowning, my sister's going to die, she's drowning. And I race across the parking lot where the repairman for the association there was working on the front door. He's like, where? I said, the pool. He raced over the pool. I couldn't get in the door. No one's answering. So our apartment was on the basement, but we had an opening there and a fence. So you can go up some stairs. So I'm yelling, I'm yelling and yelling. And I'm throwing rocks. My mom comes out. She sees me and I tell her, my mom, like, freaking Batwoman jumps over the fence, superhuman strength. She jumps over the fence and races there and everybody else does. When they get there, my sister's starting to sink because there's no suits filling up. So they create a human change. My mom was like 98 pounds, hundred pounds. 
So they lowered her down and they pulled her out just as my sister went under. I watched this. She goes under and they're like, hurry, because she went under and my mom pulls her right out. So without a second to spare. So because I had the dream, because my mom took the time to rehearse it with me, I was able to react in a different way. We couldn't change the event, but we could change the reaction. And that's what I found out about pre precognition premonitions is most of the time you can't change the event. You can change the reaction. And we did. And my sister is with us today. Well, the most startling thing I'll tell you, because my sister never liked to talk about any of this and she, but she knows the story. She's heard it ever since she was a kid. And she said to us, she goes, you know, Chris, she goes, I don't really remember that, but I'll tell you what. I remember when I was three years old, which was a year and a half later, she goes, I woke up in my room and I looked around the room and I realized I existed. I go, what? Who does that? She goes, I just realized I'm here. I exist. And I'm sitting there going, oh my God, Kelly, do you know what I, I think that means? That soul that was within you was supposed to die, but because it didn't die, it stayed just a little bit longer, but its time was up. It left. And then your soul came in because what I've heard, and I, I haven't experienced in my own life, but what I've heard is that souls, they come into the body, but they can leave at any time and some other soul can take over. And I'm sitting there going, oh my God. you know, I So I can't imagine the alternate reality of me growing up without a sister that died or I didn't do anything and I stood there and watched or jumped in and I might've died too. Don't know. So I think the universe realized, you know, we got to give him a chance to save something. Otherwise it's going to greatly impact his life. Now, Chris, do you feel like this is an aspect of the same soul that came in, or do you feel like it's a completely different kind of energy or what, what, what's your I honestly theory do or what know. do you know? I, I don't know. I never really yeah. pursued it any more than that. Cause my sister doesn't really like to talk about a lot of this stuff. Got it. You know, yeah. You know, I, I had interviewed a babysitter that we had over a year ago, which I'm, I'm going to have her on my podcast. She was telling me stuff when she babysit us in the house that I didn't know because it was from her perspective with my sister. She says that my sister was terrified. She saw some of these things too, didn't want to talk about it. So she would go into my room, then into my sister's room to comfort us why this stuff was going on. And then the sitter told me stuff that happened, the books that went flying off the shelf, the time an apparition went down the hallway. You know, and then she would see these black masses as well that would fly around the room. So she remembers me talking about these little creatures, remembers me talking about these other spirits, and she remembers comforting us. And I'm like, oh my God, because I hadn't talked to her since I was really a kid about this stuff. And when I started asking her, she goes, oh yeah, I remember it all. She goes, so does Dory, because Dory used to babysit. Dory didn't want to babysit you guys anymore, you know, because she had an experience. And then also... um, her other sister, because there's three sisters that would babysit us, but she babysit us the most. The other sister had an experience where the door goes flying off the off the door hinge. And I'm like, what? So we're finding all this other stuff that went on the house that I didn't never, I was never told because time and went on and they just didn't think to say anything until I asked. So I was like, holy cow. So I have to get her documented stating this of what my sister and I experienced from her perspective. Yeah. And there must be a reason, a divine timing, why this would be. Uh, when you would get in touch with the babysitter from years well, past. There, I'm going to start writing my book too. <laughs> I realized that I need to get these other perspectives from people that have been to my house because I'm writing a book about it. And they're just as important the story as me telling the story because they have, you know, second and third person, you know, uh, collective experiences that have had this. I wish I could just get rid, of, uh, get rid of, get a hold of this one sitter that experienced this one horrific night but she quit the very next day and we never kept in touch with her going back to what, 73, 74. Well, no, that would have been because uh, I remember the comic book I was reading at the time was published in 76 or 77. So it would have been then. And we never saw her again. I don't even know if she's still alive or she lived in Chicago, but we don't have a record of her name. But I just remember what she went through and I went through. And the next day she quit. I was in the backseat of the car. She's complaining to my dad saying, you got the devil in your house. She's like, and my dad turns me, see what you're doing. You're putting this in her head. I go, no. And she says, listen, don't you dare say that to your son because I saw it. He saw it. So you need to believe him. He's like, oh, come on. It's you guys' imagination and this and that. And, and I'm like, dad, it's real. you know. And then she says, just let me off here. She goes, I'll take a cab home or take the bus because she was just tired of arguing with my dad. And she was that scared. So it was like, I'm like, don't go. Don't go. And she's like, honey child. She was like, you take care of yourself and you know, you keep your faith strong. And I'm like, how's that going to help me? <laughs> I'm going back to the same house. You you would find out years later how that would help you. And you know, speaking of activity around it you, uh, I, I think I, I saw today. something where you and your mom are still having activities around oh, you. God, that yeah. you document. Oh, yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. And then what's your mom's story in all of this? Uh well, my mom came home. She was like, What happened to her sitter? And she called her, and the woman says, Excuse me, I'm never coming back to that house again. 
She's like, why? She goes, you got darkness there. And my mom's like, what? And my mom didn't know, you know, the whole story. And, but my mom knows all the experiences I've had. She's had a couple experiences with me where I came home once with my friend and uh, we were in seventh grade and we were, we were ding dong ditching houses, you know, and I felt kind of guilty and I'm not supposed to do that. And, and there was allegedly one woman was a witch. You know, my friends said, I go, watch she's a witch. Because we're going to go ding dong. So she wasn't a witch, but you know, we ding dong and, and she got in her car to try to follow us. And we were terrified, you know, so I'm thinking, oh my God, something's going to happen. So I'm in my house and I'm, I'm releasing fear, right? My mom's like, let's go upstairs. My sister was at camp. My parents were divorced. My mom turns off the light. We go in the hallway to go upstairs and we hear this moan throughout the whole house. Like, oh, my mom's like, what the hell is that? Your friends messing around? I said, no, they were home. I watched them go in their house. You know, we got school tomorrow. And I'm like, oh my God. So we go, we race up into the room. We slam the door. We're scared, you know? And I'm in my mom's room. We got the door closed. We start hearing noise in the house if this, as if things are breaking, that someone broke in. My mom's about to call the police. I go, mom, it's the ghosts. I'm telling you, you know, they're, they're going to think we're crazy. So we, we get up some strength. We open up the door. We go downstairs. Nothing was broken, even though we heard glass shattering, everything. We went into the basement. The only thing that was different was that there was a picture of my dad that I had hanging in the basement that fell off the wall. That was it. So my mom's like, your dad's doing this. There's something attached to your dad. Your dad must have some evil attached to him. I'm like, oh, mom, you know, I don't, you know, I don't know. So that was, that was a collective experience both in her had. We didn't see the ghost, but we, we heard it. But you guys, as you said, you, you, you were feeding it fear, right? So what well, do you I was feeling that? fear because I was thinking what I was doing that something was going to follow me. So at first right. I thought maybe this witch did something, even though she's not a witch, but when you're, when you're in seventh grade, you don't, you don't know, no, you know, you just believe what your friends tell you, you know, it's yeah. like. Hey, you know, Chris, I remember being terrified, seeing all these people all the time, and I would fake sick to not go to grade school. And my mom told her dad, who was a Presbyterian preacher, you better talk to Susie because she doesn't want to go to school. And I finally told him I could see spirits, I could see lights around people. And to my surprise, he said, I can see them too. And so he really wow. helped me. But if if you don't have that kind of perspective or that kind of of understanding and help, it can be a circuitous path to figure out what to do with all of oh, this. Yeah. My so, mom would tell um, me, why are you telling people outside our house? And and I went to a Catholic school and I remember first grade, I'm telling all these kids, some kids like, you're lying. There's no such thing as ghosts. I'm telling the teacher. I'm like, no, it's real. And one girl's like, I believe you. I go, okay, you're my best friend then, right? And teacher pulls me out in the hallway. I'll never forget this, you know, and I wish I could confront her today. I don't know if she's still alive, but she pulled me out in the hallway. She's shaking me. She goes, quit lying. She goes, ghosts aren't real. I go, yeah, they're says, you're lying. Stop lying. And I'm crying. And, you know, back then she'd get a lot of trouble for shaking me like that, you know, but we're talking back, you know, in the seventies, she's doing that, telling me I'm lying. She was just one step away from slapping me thinking I was, I'm like, my parents told me to tell the truth and I'm telling the truth and I'm getting in trouble for telling the truth. I was so confused. So I came up, told my mom, my mom's like, why you do not tell them? And then when they sat for parent teacher conference, they said, your, your son has a wild imagination, you know, and just, he's really, he's great with all the students. He's very, he's very artistic, you know, cause I was doing art and they think we think he's just going to be an artist one day. And that's it. My mom's like, how dare you say that's all you think he's going to be. I mean, I've been a successful mortgage broker, a professional speaker, all this other stuff, regardless of what they say. But, you know, back then teachers were a little, I think a little bit narrow-minded, but I'll never forget the ghost thing is what I'm trying to point out is the way I was treated in one years old. I mean, that's, that, that's damaging for kids. Like, wait a minute, I'm telling you the truth. And then you're telling me that I'm lying, but my parents told me. And I'm like, so I told my, I told her and they're like, do not tell anybody at school, you know, but I couldn't help it. You know? And then some of my friends, when I tell them they wanted to sleep over. And then in third grade, when I was old enough, they slept over and they had experiences. All three of us saw a ghost that came down the hill right up to the window. And they still talk about it today. They're like, I was there, is man. this what made you want to um, work with psychic kids? No, um, no, not, not at that point. You know, when I'm a little kid, I didn't think no, I'd be I doing mean, this. I wanted to be but a later on or something, in, you know, later on in life, when you got a chance to help psychic yes, kids, yes. did that feel like, okay, this has come full circle? Yeah. When I was doing dead famous, you know, we were, we were going to locations. I was coming in contact with various spirits, famous ones and not so famous. I was witnessing murders and stuff like that. So for me, it was like, okay, I'm figuring out all the different types of spirits that are out here. Cause now I'm doing it and going to these places I've never been to. Then, you know, I started seeing, uh, you know, ghost hunters came out, ghost adventures came out. 
um, made a guest appearance in Ghost Adventures, but I was on a conference call with A&E because I really liked what I did with Dead Famous. We were trying to create some new concept for me to do. And the uh, uh, the head of VP, she says, you know what? We, we should have had you on Psychic Kids. You'd be perfect for this show. And we're going to be revamping and restructuring it for the second season. Would you like to be an, uh, you know, on one of the episodes? I said, oh my God, I'd love to, because that's me. That's what I went through as a kid. And here I am as an adult. I know what they're going through. So I did two episodes, uh, the second season, and I did three on the third season. We all split it up between Chip and then Kim Russo was on an episode as well. So it was working with Edie Nathan, working with a certified professional, you know, counselor, therapist, and everything was fantastic because we had two different vantage points. We had the, basically the mental issues that some of these kids and f- families were dealing with. And then we had the spiritual stuff and together we worked together on this. It was one of the greatest shows I ever did next to help my house is haunted because we were actually helping people. And when I take a look at that show, which I use as a bar for other shows, as the director says, listen, we just film you. This is like a three, four day workshop. We shoot it. You guys tell us what you want to do, what you think you should do. And that's what we did. And it was great because we helped these families. I still keep in touch with some of these kids. You know, I had one of them reach out to me two years ago, just late one night says, Hey man, I just want to tell you how much you meant to me with my dad and this and that our relationship, you know, grew because my dad then accepted me after you spoke to him about your dad. And I'm just realizing, you know, this is, this is what I'm supposed to do, you know? And then the same thing with help my house is haunted, where we went to businesses and homes to help people. I'm like, this is game day. This is what I was groomed for. This is what the spirits, why what happened to me in that house happened so that I'd be prepared for this. And that's what I do it. But I also, people don't realize, and, and it does rub, I'm just going to say this to fellow psychics and mediums out there. It does rub a lot of psychics the wrong way. They'll say I'm cocky. They'll say I'm this, I'm that. You have to understand. I was also an athlete. I played 15 years of football. I won championships. I was a running back. I got hurt, but I also kicked some ass. I played baseball. My dad was a 13-year NHL hockey player, one of a badass that got in fights all the time. And he won a Stanley Cup, almost won a second one with New York Rangers. So I come from a mindset, not of psychics and, and new age stuff. I come from tough Chicago, you know, athlete, like I'm going to get on that field and I'm going to kick some ass or don't get in my way for doing what I got to do. I do treat people with respect. Anybody that's worked with me knows that. And I treat even the spirits more respect than I do some of the producers and directors because I have a job to do and I want to make sure they're, they appreciate what I'm doing and I don't get any curses or anything. But because of that approach, it's, it's rough, it's raw, it's different than other people out there. And I don't do that for a self-image. It's just the way I was raised, you know? And it's like, I try not to step on people's toes or anything like that, but I have a, a different edge to the way I do stuff, you know? And some people, it's not the norm for your regular psychic media, you know, and I'm a straight heterosexual male, you know, I, I, I appreciate the beauty of women and this and that. So I'm saying that it's different than some of the other male psychics out there. You know, it's just take it or I, leave it. I I'm totally no better than it. anybody else. I'm no you better know what? than We also else, like you know? that you don't take crap from the spirits. It's like, I've right. seen you before where you, you know, you've merged consciousnesses with uh, a discarnate and you're like, all right, you're getting out now. You're, you're leaving now. What, what is it about you that has this barometer of knowing you can push this envelope only so far. Where do you think that came from? Did it come from um, the rough and tumble and competitive thing? Did is it a blend of the sensitivity? Do you just well, two look things. at this it's, as an art? How how does it work? You know, when you've been held out, held down by an eight to nine foot demon in front of your girlfriend, okay, and she's terrified and screaming because she sees your body go into the bed and you can't breathe, and then you see this half serpent, half insect creature that's on top of you. She goes and gets holy water, throwing it on it. And you realize, okay, I've had experiences before with demons when I was a little kid, this and that. I've done exorcisms, deliverance. Wow, this I've never seen a creature like this before. Okay, so I was actually not afraid because I know they can't really hurt you. Over time, they can manipulate you, cause oppression, and, and that's a whole nother ballgame. But I have a strong belief that my mom gave me as a kid in angels. And I took my confirmation name of Michael. Cause I had experience with these creatures on top of me one night when I was a little kid, I get all these scratches all over me and I'd wake up in this one night, this things were on me and I turned around all of a sudden they were off me. I'm like, wait, they were just on me scratching me and everything. And I turned around and I see Archangel Michael. And it was the first time I had seen him. 
And I see him from a perspective where I'm looking up, his feet are hovering above me. And I see up to his chest plate and him looking down, peering over, looking at me in all this light and this armor. And then he shoots up this beam of light and he's gone. And I'm like, they're gone. He saved me. I was, oh my God, God saved me. So I told my mom the next day, she was, oh my God, that was a mark, the Archangel Michael, which is then I took his, his name when I had confirmation. So I realized, wow, angels are real. And my mom always believed them. So we discussed them further. So I would call upon them when these negative things would happen. And that just progressed into life with many other experiences with them that I know when you call upon them, they'll be there. So for me, it's like, I'm not invulnerable. I've learned that. I spoke to that. Some of my friends that are exorcists and demonologists, we all get damaged. We all get hurt physically or mentally. And people get affected around us that we just can't protect. But I know I'm eternal. This is just a vessel. I'm more than my physical body. I know angels are real. I know the creator is real. I know Jesus is real. And I know many of these other highly evolved enlightened beings are real too, that you can just call upon them when you ascend to that level of consciousness that they will respond. So there's no fear. I just did an exorcism a couple of weeks ago with a priest in Indiana, and as well as another gentleman that gets involved in these types of cases that came, picked me up because my car was in the shop. We went, he drove me all the way out there. And this, this man, that's entity, a couple other people, friends of him committed suicide, and it was trying to get him to commit suicide. So that was the fear that we need to intervene. Well, I'm talking to this demon, and this demon is pretending to be this major big demon. I'm powerful. I could break you. This And then I said, I'm just not feeling it. I'm not feeling the discernment. I mean, I know there's something there because I see this kid's father that passed away. I see one of the people that committed suicide. I see these angels outside that are waiting for the moment of when they're going to extract. And I'm sitting there going, this demon's pretending to be this ego that it's so much more than what it is. I say, you're just a little demon. You're not a big demon. I go, who are you? So I'm not going to tell you. I'm not gonna, you're not going to tell me because you're afraid. And they goes, well, I am Baal, you know, Baal or whatever. And then I'm like, no, you're not. I don't feel it at all. He says, well, he goes, yeah, Satan's standing right behind you. And I look, I go, nobody's here. I go, I feel nothing. If I did, I would feel the, the heaviness. I would feel the evil. My hairs would stand on end. There's nobody, you're lying. So you've based all your strength and your power on lying. That doesn't mean that you haven't gone and, and done this to other people. I believe you have, you know, but let's just get to the point. Let's stop lying. Let's just be honest. Okay. You know, and I was like, oh, I'm not talking to you. I said, you're not talking to me because I'm breaking through and I'm making sense. Listen, I'm not going to judge you. I'm not going to hurt you. You know, I'm not here to do that. I just, I just want to get to understand you. What do you want? What do you truly want? You can't help me. And I go, yeah, I can. I just want to know. Just, just tell us. What is it you truly want? He goes, I want peace. I go, you want peace? I know I'm breaking through, right? And this was after three hours. I'm like, okay, so why do you think you can't have peace? Because I killed four people. I made them kill themselves. I said, he didn't kill them. They, using their free will, weren't able to identify enough to pull themselves away from you. They did it, but they're not dead. Two of them are here now. So they're eternal, just like us. So you didn't do that. You did something wrong, yes, but you did not kill them. They still exist. He's like, well, you know, I just, uh, and I want to kill you, and I want to kill you. And I, kill. I said, okay, so then just don't think that anyway. Just stop. I said, you need to forgive yourself. And then you figure, well, I can't because they won't, what? They won't forgive you. And I said, Father, do you forgive him? I said, you know, Brad, do you forgive him? You know, his aunt, do you, do you forgive him? I said, I forgive you. I said, the souls that are here, do you forgive? And he starts tearing up as if he was communicating with them. And he says, so you mean I really can't? I said, listen, it's not my call. It's your call and the creator's call. I said, do you see the angels that are outside? He goes, I don't want to look at them. I said, why? If you want to be forgiven, you have to forgive yourself first before you can be forgiven. And then he did. And I said, I want you to go with him. And then whew, he's gone. He's like, thank you. And then, but before he left, I said, tell everybody you're sorry. And he says, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. And he's crying. He's like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And then he left. So not every case is like that. Please understand. Okay. I'm, I'm sitting there after two hours. I'm getting, oh my God, nothing's working. I go, this, this thing's lying. I said, okay, I need to take a different approach. And I'm like, God, what do I do? And, and I get this intuition to do it. I get frustrated just like everybody else. Then he was gone. So as talking to God, it's, it's a form of prayer that led you into discerning what would heal this situation. And in this case, rather than just casting out a, a, a demon, it's actually helping the demon forgive itself and heal itself. Where does that come from, Chris Fleming? Well, the thing is, I've been doing counseling for 17 years for people. I went to college to get a degree, which I got a bachelor's of arts, and I was also going to get a degree in psychology, but ran out of money and ran out of time. 
And I had to go back another term, which was another $7,500, did not have it. My parents didn't have it. I didn't go. And I said, you know what, just I'll, I'll do it some other time. And I never did. But I went into that spiritually in 2006, where I started doing that for people because people would come to me with paranormal stuff. And the next thing you know, it was other stuff too. So I just started doing it. Um, but where does it come from? The discernment, it doesn't come from me. It just comes from higher consciousness and the creator himself. And I know that I can't remove this thing. I can't. Okay. I don't have that power, but the Holy Spirit, as well as the creator guides anything else, they assist. That's why there was all these other spirits that were there and the angels were outside. When I know they're outside, I said, okay, there's going to be an extraction. I don't know how, I don't know when, but they're they're ready for that moment to when it occurs. And then I just go with the flow, whatever my intuition's telling me, whatever this entity says. And I could tell it's lying. It started like stumbling over its words. I said, you're not this, you're not that. You're just trying to impress these bigger demons so you can gain some type of authority. So just cut the bullshit. I'm like, come on, man, you're wasting our time, this and that. What is it that you want? Forget about us. What do you want? And that's when it just said, I want peace. I said, you want peace because you are an offspring of the fallen. And they're all telling you, you need to do these nasty things, but you're really tired of doing it because it's like a little high that lasts for a little while, then it's gone. Then you feel empty again, but you keep doing it to not feel empty, which is an addiction, just like humans have. And you've got this addiction. Just don't you want to stop? You know, it's like, yes, I do. You know how I can't, you know, and then they're just, remember, they come from a similar consciousness. Okay. As we do, but just, I just treat them as if it's just like counseling, but I use spiritual development and assistance from whatever comes through to what to say. That's really remarkable. And I know that you do a lot of things to take good care of yourself too. And right. you're an artist, you're a professional artist, people buy your work, but I think the art also helps you to heal. And then you have this great relationship with um, your cats. Can you tell us about some of the ways that yeah. the animals um, help you? My mom had a little kitten when she was a little kid and uh, she loved it. It was the greatest thing. She'd come home and every day, couldn't wait to get home. And then one day she came home, it was gone. And her mother told her, yeah, your dad got rid of it. He didn't like it. And it was making a mess of the house. My my mom hated my dad her whole life because of that. She loved that thing. She said she cried for a long period of time and hated her father because he took away the one thing that she, you know, and that's damaging. So yeah. my mom says when she gets older and have kids, she's going to make sure that, you know, the kids have pets and they're never taken away. So when we grew up, we had pets, we had cats, and she taught us to take care of them and to love them just like family. And that's what we did. And I'm very grateful because I've had five cats in my life that all had wonderful lives and lived full lives from seven, 17 to 21 years. And I remember the last one, which was like 2006, 2007, I said, I can't take it anymore. It was just too emotional for me, even though I had experiences with them after in the afterlife, I can't do this. So I said, I'm not going to no more pets. And then the girl I was dating at the time had a rescue uh, in the area uh, cat that was homeless that, you know, I ended up taking home and I'm glad I did. It became my buddy, but I had a vision um, after that cat died, where I'm in like this basement, I see all these animals and I look down and I see in sequence, every single cat that I had walk past my legs and rub up against me as if they're coming into my life and leaving my life. Then I see a black cat. I see a white cat, another tabby, and I see a couple other cats. And then I'm just confused about who are these other cats are not mine. They said, one day you will. I said, no, I won't. I I've got four of them right now. So the vision has come true. But not only that is when I had the first cat. And I was getting this and I got this other cat and all of a sudden I'm standing next to both my guides and they're really tall. And I'm just talking with them in present moment that we've always known each other. And I'm like, you guys were right, man. He says, we told you, we knew, you know, you needed them and they make a big difference in your life. And then the other guy, the other guy says, should we tell him? She goes, and he's like, ah, we're not supposed to, it hasn't happened yet. I go, tell me what? Do not tell me something's going to happen to one of these cats after I just, you guys, if something's like, no, 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 that's not it. Just, we can't tell you. I said, well, <laughs> you know, I'm done. I got two cats and they start laughing. I'm like, why are you guys laughing? He says, you'll see. Sure enough, I get a third cat. My my sister gives me one on Christmas. That was a uh, kitten went into her barn, had this the a litter. And she decided to give me one because it reminded her of tiger and squirt, the two cats that I love dearly. Then I ended up got attracted to this other cat in September that I saved that someone was getting rid of. So. I have the four cats and the guides have played a big part of that because when I got in the car accident, 2009, um, got out of a toxic relationship that where she had attachments. And then all these creatures from my childhood came back. A lot of it's documented. And it was just one of the most horrific experiences I went through in my life. But 
it made me have empathy, patience, and compassion towards other that go through very toxic and damaging relationships. It also gave me the same for people that are suffering chronic pain because I suffer chronic pain every single day. Like right now, I'm in a lot of pain with my neck. So yeah. for 13 years, you know, I've been coping with this and it's allowed me to do that. It's prevented me from doing a lot of things in my life. But as someone said to me, what can you do? And what I can do is I went back to doing art and, and just painting because it gives me that expression of being here that I can do. I can't play sports and work out like I used to, which is really disappointing, but then you just shift. So I focus on all the things that I can do for myself and for others. And that's what I'm doing. But I tell you this one last thing about the guides and the cats, which is really cool, is a friend of mine, Amanda runs Panda Paw Rescue up in uh, Washington and Oregon area where she rescues all these pets. She was on Animal Planet for a while and her and I had met on this boat cruise back in 2011. She knew who I was. I didn't know where she was. And we talked about the paranormal, became good friends. I said, well, I'll help you whenever you can to find homes for these, these pets that you rescue. And I remember she goes, hey, I need some help. We just came across a house that had 50 Persian cats. Uh, some of them have to be put down because they're diseased and very sick. But I've got a couple. I'm only sending a couple to each person pictures. Can you post this and try to find a home? I said, okay, send me a couple pictures. So she sends me two pictures. Very first picture I get. For a year, I've been having premonitions. My guide's been telling me that when I see a white cat, I have to take that white cat. Well, the girlfriend I had previously in the toxic relationship, we went and adopted a white cat because I thought, well, that's what they wanted. She ended up taking the cat. I said, well, that didn't work. The first thing she sends me is this one picture, Amanda, of this little puffball white cat. And not only did I say, oh my God, it's a white cat. They've told me I need a white cat, but I felt it. I messaged right back. I want the cat. And then I wanted the other cat she sent to you. She said, well, I'm only going to give you one. I said, well, I want the other cat. They're sisters. They're brothers and sisters. Said, no, she says, no, you can take the white one. So I flew out to uh, Seattle and I went and got the cat. Now, a week or two before I was supposed to go, she did all the med the, the shots and everything and got everything prepared and the documents and the, and the in the medical exam. She says, we need a name. I said, I don't know the name. So I said, I'm going to go to bed tonight and I'm going to see what gets revealed. I wake up in the morning and I still don't have a name. And I'm like, God, you know what? I really hope that this new white cat gets along with Noir. And then my guide pops in and goes, oh, you mean Sweden? Sweden? Yeah, that's her name. What? I jump out of bed. I race downstairs. I text Amanda, Sweden. Her name's Sweden. She writes back. She goes, that's an incredible name. Where'd you get it? My guys just told me and I love it. And that's her name. And that totally fits her. I could not see her having any other name. And even everybody at the animal, the, the animal hospital where I've taken to their, you know, at times they go, Oh, Sweden's back. We remember when she was a kid in Sweden. Everybody knows Sweden, you know? I love so, it. Do you think that anything. God sends you the pets that you need yes, to have? Because I went through a really bad time, 2014 and 16. Where I was not myself because of well, the that, pain. That's after you had a near death experience. Was that uh, 2010? Well, it's also after I was at the demon house in Indiana. Yikes. So it latched onto me as well. But I was dealing with a lot of pain. And it, it was, right. a, you know, you have to go to your high to low. I went to my high in my life where I was so successful and everything else, where I was in the mortgage business and then, you know, getting the car accident, everything crash. You know, I was speaking, geez, 25, 30 places a year. And I was busy in the mortgage business and everything, and then get the car accident and crash. And then I hit a low point where I had the worst time of my life. I experienced everything was, was negative and everything was bad. So I had to go through that. But uh, after the, the whiplash, the car accident I have, and I still have damage in my neck now, which we're discussing to get surgery and then I'm going to get stem cells, is I would wake up choking or I would stop breathing and I'd be hovering above my body because I stopped breathing. And I'd be yelling at myself, breathe, breathe, breathe. And I'd get sucked back into my body and I'd come up and I'd be like, oh my God, get that last air to stay alive. Well, the one time I didn't breathe and I'm on the other side and I know it because I'm in this darkness and then I'm walking to where I see a light in the distance, you know, the little tunnel. And there's this guy, he's like, hey, and I go, hey, how you doing? What's up? All right, let's go. Let's go. And he's like, no, 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 we can't go. I said, what do you mean can't go? I go, wait a minute. Don't tell me you're going to tell me I got to go back. He's like, yeah, they want to send you back. I said, no, you know, the law of the universe is free will, right? So if I want to go and I don't want to go back, I don't have to go back. He's like, you're right. You, you know, I said, of course I know, you know? So I said, all right, let's go. He's like, well, can I show you something? I said, ah, uh, I know what you're going to do. You want to show me something's going to change mine? He's like, Chris, I would never try to change your mind. Now, please understand. I'm saying this word for word. Okay. Cause I remember this like it was yesterday. And I said, 
okay, so what? Because I want to show you something. So we don't show me something's going to change my mind. Chris, I got to change your mind. Can I just show you something, please? I'm stubborn. I'm a tourist. I said, fine, show me. It's not going to make a difference. So I look, and next thing you know, we're on this ledge. We're like on a bridge. We're looking down. We see thousands of people all dressed in pearlescent robes, which was their higher self, their souls. Okay. All these souls are elbow to elbow looking up at us. I'm like, oh my God, who are all these people? They weren't there a second ago. They're looking at us. Who are these people? So I'm glad you asked, Chris. Oh no, free will. I just asked him a question. Those are all the people you haven't met yet. And I go, what? I don't even know them. I turned and looked. And with an instant, I got flashes from every single person that was so overwhelming. Every interaction, everything they've done for me to, on their path, or I've done for them and helped them and this. And I looked at them and I'm bawling, bursting with emotion going, oh my God, I felt all their pain, their suffering and everything that if I'm not there, I said, it's not about me. It's about them. Oh my God, I'm so selfish. Forgive me. He's like, I know. Do you want to go back? I go, send me back right now. And boom, I went back to my body. So when I came out of that, I'm breathing again, everything. I'm like, wow, that was a weird dream, you know, until a couple of weeks later, I met uh, the NACACON, National Association of College Activities, because I speak at colleges and universities. I've been doing that since 2006. And I'm with another speaker there, John Battaglia. And he says, hey, Chris, can I talk to you? You know about dreams? I go, yeah, I know a little bit. What do you want to know? Well, I keep having this dream. All right, tell me about it. He goes, I'm standing next to all these people and we're waiting for somebody. I keep having this dream every night. He goes, and I look up and these two people appear on this ledge and I say, who's that? He goes, oh, that's the person that's going to teach us something or, or tell us something. He goes, so I look at this person. Do you know who this? And he looks at me and goes, it's you. And I go, and I'm sitting there going, oh my God. Now I somehow I, I subconsciously reverted back to that vision, that dream. And I'm seeing him in the crowd. I get up with tears flooding down and he does too. We start hugging each other. And all the guys are like, whoa, you guys having a bro moment? What's going on here? I said, no, you don't understand. <laughs> And I'm like, that was real? That was real? He goes, yes. He goes, what do you mean real? He goes, you've had the same dream? I said, I'm the one on the top of the thing. He's like, okay, well, I got a question. He goes, I've been wanting to ask it. Nobody can answer it. And he asked me the question and I knew the answer. I just knew the answer. To me, it seems really simple. And I just, he's like, oh my God, you're right. That's it. And he changed the dynamics of what he does and everything based on that answer. So I sit there going, what the heck? This was real. And then there was a progression of other people saying, hey, I saw you on the bridge. We were on the bridge. And there was a walk-in. One person says, Chris, I'm here to remind you of the bridge because you're, you're straying off your path. And that just continues. Then, of course, when I got to do Help My House is Haunted, okay, here I am, and I'm seeing all these soldiers coming forward, bloodied and everything. I'm looking at them and Barry and Sandy are going, do you see something? I go, yeah, I'm seeing all these soldiers. And they didn't have a lot of it in the episode. But I said, we need to, when we're done, we need to go out there. There was battles and wars here that all these soldiers are still here. We go outside at the end, at like six in the morning. And I say, how many are here? It said thousands. Why are you still here? Nobody prayed for us. So when they died in these battles, their bodies were just buried there. They never went back to the villages and got proper burials to be with their family and the rituals that are normally for them to ascend. So because of that, they never ascended. So. I said, we're going to do prayers for you. And I have a recording. I say, I'm going to do prayers for you. Can you yell out? Let us know you're here. You hear all these, a huge crowd go, Rah! they found us. Yeah. Right. I have that on audio. Oh my gosh. So, you're talking about electronic voice phenomenon. Oh, we have it. Our whole crew okay. heard it. Uh, and Chris, Chris is a big evidence-based um, worker. This is for where the I light. learned about EVPs right here. I yeah. saw this in 1976, 77, this documentary, Seminal. my mom, let me stay up. Mm -hmm. That taught me about EVP, which I started doing at that young age. A couple of weeks later, my dad got me a real to real player. But the thing is I want to regress to is then I'd been to Gettysburg and I did some prayers for the dead, everything. When I was a little kid, these souls were appearing to me because they'd been dead for a period of time, but I had not met them yet, but they knew because this soldier says, are you the one that's been sent for us? I go, what do you mean one sent for you? I'm just here doing a TV show. No, are you the one that's going to bring us home? I said, what? And then I realized, oh my God, not only coming back to help the living, but also the dead and praying for them. But also when I was a little kid, the, the soldiers and stuff that were coming through the walls were them waiting for me, but I had not been there yet because I hadn't grown up knowing what I'm supposed to do. So it all came full circle. And I realized that's why I'm here. That's why I'm doing, I have, I have to dedicate myself to this. I made a promise in the bridge and this is what I'm doing. Well, this may play right into a question that one of the Carefree Souls, my online community members sent in. And he's asking, 
Um, it's a very long question. So I'm just going to summarize. Do you think that certain people come to the earth with a mission to work with this uh, dark side? I'll say so-called dark side. And do you, or do you think that some people just get caught up in it and have to figure out what to do because they have abilities? How much of this is pre-planned? Well, both. But then you can go off your path, which some people do, in which I was told a couple of times in my life, they intervened, said you're going off your path and stuff is too long to, to discuss. But here's the one thing I'll tell you that I learned, okay? Is that, and, and if you look at the gateway analysis and you read the gateway analysis done by army intelligence, talking about the absolute, but then also other spiritual development experiences, is the absolute created many different dimensions and existences and we're one of them. The absolute, the creator is in all of us, but gave us an individual personality to experience. So if you're sitting next to an atheist that doesn't believe in the afterlife, thinks that's it, and is going to argue to the day they die, I've learned you really don't have a right to argue and debate with them and tell them they're wrong because that's just a belief they have, which is allowing the absolute and the creator to have that experience through that perspective. So regardless, when they die, they're going to realize that there's, there's an afterlife. But the absolute, the creator, to experience all things must even experience not knowing itself. So if someone goes into the dark side, like for example, I had an experience, I'm in my office now. This was several years ago. All of a sudden, oh, I'm in hell. I'm smelling sulfur. I'm hearing a metallic ding, ding, and this big bull creature walks up to me. I said, oh my God. I've just traveled right now consciously somewhere else. This demon walks up to me and looks at me, but I'm looking at him from a higher consciousness and, and myself is saying, you have a reason to exist. It's not a battle. There is a battle that's going on, but you have a reason to exist to teach people the dark as well as the light. So I realized that it's all part of a plan. It's not just like we got to fight this to be for the creator and we got to do No, he's allowing this to all happen for all these experiences for himself as well as others to have. We would not have that without these things. And I'm sitting there going, it's hard for us as humans to understand pain and suffering and stuff like that unless we're an eternal being and we realize it's just temporary. So the whole lesson is that pain and suffering and the experiences, but overcoming it because it's only a short period of time. So these things play a big part. The darkness and everything plays a big part with the light until the creator says enough and it's over. So I'm sitting there going, wow. So from now on, don't get in arguments with skeptics and atheists. Love them and appreciate them because the creator is experiencing something different through them. Contrasts have a reason to be contrasting. Yep. yep. So when your neck is killing you, mm -hmm. and I can, I can relate to that. Yep. Um, I just got like 16 or 18 shots on Monday mm -hmm. in the back of my head, neck, throat, and all of that for cervical stuff. Oh, um, what do you do to tell yourself or to pull yourself back into sort of like an equilibrium? And um, do you limit how much you work? Do you have control of that? Are there contractual things that make you push beyond? How do you take care of yourself? Uh, uh, filming film is becoming a little bit more difficult, uh, traveling, uh, not getting enough rest uh, gets exhausting because there's times where I don't sleep. You know, I'm tossing and turning because of the pain, because the brain's active. It's an active fight or flight mode, so it won't shut down. I, I smoke cannabis. I take edibles. Um, I have a license for that medical license. I was, my friends are like, dude, in high school, you used to yell at us for doing this and you never did this. And now you're I'm like, Hey man, I'm doing it for medical reasons in it. And it works great. <laughs> you know, it helps temporarily what I'm saying, but it, but it brings back my personality to enjoy the pain rather than fighting the pain. Do you understand what I'm saying? I do. So, but the thing is, is I still believe because I remember when they told me like, if you don't walk out of this, this relationship right now in a month, you're going to get in a car accident. I'm like, what am I going to die? No, but it's going to slow down your life. And it's going to take longer for you to succeed what you want to do. I said, it's going to take longer. Okay. So I can still succeed, which means that I must be able to get better because it can't end my life. So I still believe, but you know, at this point now, I've only got two remaining options, which I'm pursuing over the next couple of months, and hopefully, it's the resolution. Otherwise, I don't know what I'm going to do because it's tough. And that, that's really, the stem cell treatment that well, you're talking about. Well, we're right? talking about surgery now because we found some other things within the bones okay. within my neck. And one doctor wants me to go in to do surgery, but now the other doctor changed his mind and was 
putting me back on medication and the medication is not working. I told him I did medication. I did all that. I did the injections. I've done Reiki. I've done the elevation frequency where they burn the nerves. I've done where they had the injections. You wow. know, I've done everything so far that I know of except surgery going to removing the bones and then getting the stem cells. So those are the remaining two things. I just have to find a, a neurosurgeon that's willing to take the risk. Other surgeons are like, I'm not doing it. No way. They're just. So do you ever get to this point where, okay, with all this pain and, and all this exploration, uh, I'm still in this state, God, do you ever just say, oh, why me? What's the purpose of this? Oh, of I mean, course. we know there's an overall purpose to suffering, but do you ever want to know specifics? Yeah. A year ago, I got up and I yelled. I was watching Netflix and I got up in my my den and I just said, "That's I can't take this anymore. Here I am sitting here instead of going out and enjoying myself, but I can't be around a lot of people because I'm in pain and you know I don't always have a good time because the noise and vibrations makes it worse. I go, I can't taste. Why, God? Why did you do this to me? Why did this happen? What did I learn from this? I haven't learned anything. I lost this, 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 this. And all of a sudden, this, this female loving voice goes, Chris, you learned patience, compassion, and empathy. And I'm like, and I sat down, but I already had all that. Not like you have now. And then I saw, like, for a bleep second, my higher self having all these other lives. And now, just this was a small section of many other lives, but yet this was the classroom that I chose, you know, not listening to them. And I got in the car accident. If I would have listened, it would have been a different path. But they said, okay, this is the path that's been given to you now because of the choice you made, because our decisions do have repercussions. And, but there's always a lesson from it. Here's the lesson. I'm like, yeah, you're right. I get it. I get it. So, you know, you have to accept, you can't, you can't argue with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> that, that, that is a, a wonderful perspective that we think we have compassion, but it's like, you can always gain a little more. bit more understanding and, and reminding us of the unity that we all have with each other. Yeah, like doctors sure. don't know if they've never had that problem. They just don't right. get it. You know, like we can just get on with your life. Just don't work out just go for walks. And no, it's not that easy. It affects the mental process too. It sends signals. It causes distraction. I, I used to read a book a month. Okay. I got a whole library here. I can't read a whole book because I read a chapter and I forget what was read because of the pain and distortion going into the brain. It gets miscataloged and it doesn't go into the right folder in your memory for you to access again. I'll read it. And I don't remember what I read. I sat down and watched a movie going, I ever seen this movie before? No, I haven't seen it. I goes, I feel like I've seen this movie. And I realize I have seen the movie, but I don't remember it. So it's like I'm watching it for the first time, which is terrible because it's like, how am I going to continue? You know, it's like if this gets worse, which you know, Alzheimer's dementia, that's not what it is. Excuse me. It's just, you know, I'm I'm getting acid reflux again because I went back on this medication that the doctor gave me to try, and I have to go off it because it's given me acid reflux. And that's what happened to me in 2000. Uh, 14, uh, 2012 and 13, I went off all pain pills and muscle relaxers that they constantly had me on because it gave me GERD. You know, because you know, pharmaceuticals are really not good for you. And uh, I'm feeling now the reason why I quit doing it years ago. But to regress is that what I learned as a medium because my neck doing dead famous my whole life, I would get a tingling in the back of my neck that would tell me there's a ghost there and that's how it would connect. Okay. And that's part of the RAS system, which is the reticulator activating system which is a system, a network system that tells you when to go to bed and when to wake up. But it also tells you when there are things around you. That was compromised. I said, oh my God, how am I going to know if there's ghosts here? So I realized, wait a minute, I'm bigger than my, my physical body. I would just spread my consciousness out like a bubble and use that instead of this part of my brainstem to be the, the sensitive part. I would just spread my consciousness. Out. And then as soon as I started doing that, I started doing non-local communication. I started doing remote viewing. I started doing other stuff going, oh, wow. So I had to improvise. But in that improvisation, I expanded my abilities rather than just thinking it just came from the physical body, which it there is a part of our body that does that, but there's so much more. So it taught me something. Pushing your consciousness out, expanding more and being able to explore and and, and find yeah, even deeper skills that that can apply to anyone here. Just remembering that you're more than this physical body. Mm -hmm. Consciousness is consciousness and consciousness is non-local. 
we have that promise that there's going to be that day in its rightful time when we go to that heavenly country where there's no illness, there's no pain, there's no death, there's only love. And the souls always tell us, and you know this, Chris, as a medium, they'll tell us on the other side, they're like, I don't even remember that cancer pain, or I don't even remember, you know, how that felt. I just, I just know that it was an experience that, that in some way helped me. Um, And I I think I want to give you one more question that came in because I I think this is perfect timing. Does, does it seem like some people must have a wake up call such as a near death experience or a possession or something that really wakes them up for them to realize who they are as a soul. Is this necessary? What do you say to that? No. Um, Because, I mean, I had experiences when I was a little kid, you know, and I always thought this mentality, I'm connected angels, this and that. And the, the, the near death thing was, I think just having them realize, which I didn't realize right away was focusing on the reason why I'm here helping the living and the dead. And when they showed me the dead and, and Adam Blight had told me about prayers for the dead and this and that. And when I told him, I said, Oh my God, I'm reaching a part that other paranormal investigators aren't doing. We always had help me or please help, you know, and, and moans and stuff. We would get in some of our EVPs. Well, that's all fine and dandy, but are we finding out what they want? Are we, are we trying to help them? We're not. So I found that that was working and people that didn't believe me, I always use, that's why I use ITC as I learned that from actually watching this documentary when I was a little kid is to prove and validate I'm communicating with spirits. So I'm telling him communicate with a female, you know, there's psychics that sometimes you roll your eyes and you're like, well, how do I fully know? I said, well, if I'm telling you I'm talking to a spirit and I play it back and you hear her voice, there you go. Okay. And you get your recorders and you play it back. There you go. Like we're doing help my house is haunted. I told Jane, I could see she was a little skeptical because, because we just started working together. I said, come with me, bring your recorder. I said, we're going to go outside. There's all these ghost miners that are standing outside that had died that they never crossed over. I'm going to do prayers for them, but I want you to record this. So she's recording and I tell them, I'm going to pray for you guys to send you guys home. And and I see them cheering like, yeah, I said, they're cheering right now. And I'm telling her, she's looking at me going, okay, whatever you say. She plays back her recorder when she's analyzing that night. She messages Barry and I, and we go to her room. She goes, wait till you hear this. She goes, in all my 20 years of investigating, I've never experienced this. She goes, you were right. I went, what was I right about? I said, okay, um, Jane, I said, all, all the uh, miners are cheering right now. You hear in the recorder them all cheering. Oh. You hear these men go, ah, you know, start cheering. And she's like, and I'm like, well, there you go. And Barry's like, Chris, we're actually, we're really helping them. I said, no, and of course we're helping No, but this is like confirmation. I said, Barry, I know I told you. That's why I tell you guys, always use the EVP to get confirmation of what I'm doing or anybody else is doing. That supports what the psychic is doing. And that's why I use that that form of interaction between ITC and mediumship to validate. So I know for sure I'm, I'm getting them, but then also others that are with so that we're all on the same page instead of questioning. All right, really, you know, I want you guys to be able to hear or see what I do. And this is one way to do that. So I think it's very important to use ITC in mediumship um, because you want to be certain. And that's why I do. So, you know, for someone that hasn't had experiences, it's tough. But like Jesus says, you know, bless those who have not seen but yet believe. And I think, wow, he's right. And even though sometimes I've seen so many times, I still sometimes question, you know, it's like, why do you question? You've had these experiences. It's like, but I still do because you just, you know, you're human, right? Yeah. But the people that devotes their life and just Wow. Devoting your life. And, and, uh, you know, I've been scientifically studied it um, with University of Arizona and, and a couple other places where, you know, they, they put you to the test with double blind, triple blind studies and uh, great. I'm all for evidence, but I'm not doing it to prove anything to anybody. Just like yeah. you said, sometimes uh, being a closed minded skeptic, a materialist scientist is part of the journey and um, part of the challenge so that we can develop our own discernment. So, Chris, tell me about the aliens. What do you think is going to happen? I well, I do know they exist. Um, I've had my own experiences that I haven't discussed publicly. Plus, when I did my magazine, I interviewed a lot of people that had experiences, including military personnel. But that's besides the point. And as we see what's going on within the military now, making certain things public and reports coming out saying they're now taking a serious look at these UAPs. They now call it, and then some scientists worked for the government just said, you know, that we know there's life forms out there. We're just going to you know, 
some people might have problems with it. Some people might not. If you find this interview from several years ago, even Bill Clinton said, there's all these new discoveries you guys are going to have in your lifetime. And some of you are going to have problems with it, but it's going to be even stranger than science fiction. It's like, what is he saying? Because they know. So they're slowly instituting it and they're going to let us know. The question is why? Why now are they going to tell us? Why now are they going to share with us these other life forms? That must mean because new technology we're going to adopt into society, or is there a comet coming and that there's something that needs to be done on a galactic scale or whatever, who knows, but they're all the signs are there that they're about to tell us. And they're, they're uh, about to tell us and, and what, yep. what is in it for them? I know. I, well, that's, always that's wasn't always the question, the, the back engineering and stuff and, and finding the technology to use, which they did. They implemented. That's been going countries. on for 50, 60 oh, years. Yeah. yeah. You look at the day after Roswell by Philip Corso, he describes foreign technology division that took the Roswell craft Institute at major corporations. And it's all right there. And you can't refute it because nobody's refuted it in the military because he was very high up in the military. So that tells you what they've done in the background, but now it's caught up with them to where, you know, Either the aliens are saying, hey, listen, we're going to appear to them unless you say something. So I think that's what's coming. Like, if you don't do something, we are. So I think that's why the military is preparing it. Do you have guides that are um, extra or ultra? I don't, well, I I don't want to really go into that. (laughs) I haven't (laughs) talked about some of that stuff publicly yet, but I will. Yeah, you will. We're all going to be talking about that publicly someday and maybe not too far from now. So I think what I want to do is um, end with uh, a Scotland story. Uh, You know, I I spent uh, most of September in Scotland and Ireland last year, and um, some folks have heard about some of my ghost stories. Let's hear about something that happened to you that maybe didn't make it to film. Oh, uh, okay. I'll tell you this. We were at Camlogan Castle, and because there was the narrative story and miss of this woman that had died and was she pushed or was she not pushed? We came in contact with her and she tells us at the end, but when we were in one part of the older part of the castle, I saw that there was a Laird that had this black knight, and the black knight would go out in all black and a black horse. He would collect duties or bounties from farmers and other people. And if they didn't pay, some of them would be tortured or killed. So the people, he was showing this to me, I'm seeing this guy. And I'm seeing them calling him Satan. So I had my recorder going, recording it. And there's EVPs back and forth the whole time. I'm describing what I'm seeing and communicating with him where he would go and they would thought he was the devil because he would go in there all black. So they thought the devil was in this uniform. And what happened was he strung up a love affair with this one woman that was in the castle and he loved her and he wanted, he's always thinking about ways to leave this life to be with her because, you know, love saves the darkness. Well, the Laird found out And he was sworn to devote himself to this Laird his whole life and not ever take up a wife or anything. So the Laird had the woman killed. And when he came back from a mission and then the Laird had all the other military around him, I I can't remember whether they sent him to death or they cast him out, but the Laird wanted him to know, look what I did and showed her the body. And he was devastated because you broke the law, rule, whatever. So he just wanted to be reacquainted with her because he went into this big despair and depression when he died. So I reunited them and it was such a remarkable story, but then they're telling me, well, Chris, there's no, there's no history here. We have of any black knight. We go to another part of the castle and there's this black helmet and this black, you know, armor. I'm like, well, look (laughs) right there. You know, doesn't mean that that was his, but it's like, I'm telling you guys. Then I had it on the recording that, yes, I said, so you were a black knight that went on, you hear this. So to, to, make contact with this one spirit that nobody else really knew about that's been forgotten in history to me was extraordinary. And I wanted it to go into, but when you're dealing with people that don't understand the paranormal, they got a deadline and job, they stick with the story and they don't really always introduce these other stories that are there. And it's frustrating because it's remarkable. I mean, I could see a movie just being about this with the dark Knight, you know, and just his whole life. And then he changes and falls in love, even though he's, he's a terrible man. He's done some terrible things to people, but here he is finding the one good thing within his life and it's taken away from him. And, and know, he got like, to be seen and he got to be heard. And that had to be a big deal for him. Correct. Correct. 
Just, that's thank you. That's you know, it's like this, cool. thank you. Yeah, every time um, I see you play a piece of evidence, I, I always watch for the the eyes of all the people to get really, really big because you're like, yeah. yeah, I just told you that. I just told yeah. you that was what I heard. So it's really cool. Um, thank so you. how do people work with you? How do they how do they buy your art? I'm gonna put a lot of, of links sure. and things in for you, but for those no, who the, are just listening, where do they go? 2023, I, I want to be a bigger year for me in regarding creating you know, using the higher consciousness, everything. So I've been going back to doing art, selling prints, original art, everything. And they can go to my Etsy store, which is Chris Fleming artwork, and they can see the various prints. And then I have originals I'm selling as well, but I'll always be adding some new stuff as time goes on. I'm going to get back to doing canvas painting. I also have a podcast called Spirit Talk. I'm a little behind a month or two, but I, I'll be catching up with that in the next couple of weeks. I've been doing a podcast for now going on 17 years since 2006. So you can listen to Spirit Talk. It's on iTunes. Um, the other thing too is I'm going to be redoing my website, ChristopherFleming.com. It's really outdated. I can't update it because the templates, they don't make it anymore. So I'm switching over to Wix and I'll be doing that in February, finalizing that. So I'll have a multimedia website, which I'm excited about. But then the good news is I decided to, to do a video series. So I have a video series that I'll be launching either in February or May, and I'm going to be sharing stories and information and details from certain investigations is what, and also what I've learned in the paranormal that I think would be very educational and beneficial to mediums, to paranormal investigators, both, you know, amateur and experienced, because I want to contribute the knowledge that I've gained over 50 years with the public, plus share very important things we've captured in some of these shows that just don't make it in the show. And it's not about me. It's about these discoveries and saying, hey, I'm an investigator. My job is to share with you what I discovered, like a scientist. And so that's what I want to do with this series, to create some short, maybe some a little bit longer, play the audio, play the video, share the topics, maybe have some guests on to briefly make a statement regarding that. But I want to do something very fresh that people have watched me on all these other shows. I'm going to go back into my archive. I've kept all the audio from a lot of these shows. I'm going to go back to some of these responses, how they were significant, play for you, the soldiers, you know, yelling and saying thousand and tell that story again, but have the evidence right there. So, and plus I'm going to mix artwork in it with it, the visuals, I'm going to be using artwork and videos that I've shot on my phone or whatever at that time that I've just never, I have so much stuff I've never put out there. So I figured I've got all the content. I just need to sit down and create this. Maybe I'll do it every two weeks or once a month, you know, I'll shoot for, you know, twice a month is to do these videos. And do you still have some Archangel Michael um, creations? I, I, I don't know if those are oil paintings. Yeah, or... no, that that was all digital. Okay, that, it's a sketch really? drawing. I do everything that's digital. Mm -hmm. And that I've got the artist prints uh, right now. I think I've got eight left. And then I've got the run of the actual limited edition because we did a little bit of color correcting and stuff like that on that. But I've got those prints and a couple other angel prints. I got a new one that I'm going to be uh, putting up there next week. But I have three commissions this week and I, I got ahead of myself because I got so much to do. But in going into March, I'm going to start doing commissions, people's pets, you know, stuff like that, that I will do illustrations for them. Like I just did a commission for someone's cat and I had so much fun doing it. And I'm like, all right, you know, people are asking me. So I will open that up once the website's up in March for actual commissions. Great. So, well, there's a palpable, helpful, hopeful, and healing energy with everything that you do. Thank you. Thanks for being here on Carefree and Conscious. Chris Fleming, thank you. Thanks, Suzanne, for having me. I really appreciate it. And for everybody else for listening, bless you all. <laughs>